Okay, everyone signed in. And again, uh, welcome to the uh, the another in the series of the webinars for the Motorsport Safety Foundation, uh, providing you all sorts of resources to help you put on better high performance driver education and track day events. Um, I hope all of you are safe and healthy because that's the topic of we're, we're covering tonight is health and safety best practices. So uh, I think uh, there's Terry and there's, uh, yeah, we got a lot of people signing up. Um, this should be a fun uh, program tonight. As you can see, we've got a panel of guests, uh, contributors tonight. And what we're going to be doing is uh, I'm going to be asking each one to kind of do a very quick little intro and then talk about their best practices, things that have worked and some of the things that have not worked in, in and around the events that they've been involved in since after the lockdown. Uh, and hopefully that's going to help you in putting on your events uh, going forward here. And uh, who knows how long we're going to be in this crazy world like this. So. Uh, uh, again, thanks to our panelists for, for being on here. Uh, Jim Pomroy, give us a little wave from Chin Track Days. Jim, thanks for being on here. Uh, Michael Printup from Watkins Glen, president of Watkins Glen International. Uh, Steve Libby, who's writing away right now. Steve, who is a driving events coordinator for the Puget Sound BMW CCA chapter. And Scott Elkins, who is apparently from the Brady Bunch, but uh, we're, <laughs> we're gonna say, uh, Scott is an FIA official, uh, Formula E race director, is that uh, is actually the, the title, I think, and also a member of uh, MSF. Uh, Scott's gonna share some really interesting uh, experience from, Scott, you guys ran, what, six races in nine days in Berlin? Yeah, six races in nine days, three different tracks at the same facility, uh, three different layouts. So it's I'm I'm the uh, I'm the extreme example of of what we're talking about tonight. I think I've heard you described as the extreme example in the past. Oh, we'll see. There you go. It fits right in. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, so uh, if you have questions, what we're gonna, again we're going to do is I'm going to ask each one to do a quick little uh, background, and then we'll get into sort of giving each one a chance to share their experiences. And then after we go through all of that, we're going to do a Q&A session. And we'll be monitoring the questions as we go along. Uh, what we've found in the past that if, you know, two minutes from now, you type in a question, well, it can kind of get lost in the shuffle. So you might want to save some of your best questions for when we actually do get to the Q&A session at the end. And we're going to try to keep this to around an hour and try to get you back on your way and enjoy the rest of the evening afterwards. But uh, we're going to jam a bunch of information into this. Jim, do you mind starting and maybe just give a kind of a real quick background on your involvement and basically your involvement into uh, what you're doing with Jim? Yeah, great. Thanks, Ross. Um, I've been active in the HBD hobby now for uh, 16 plus years. And I uh, started driving with Chin Track Days uh, back then. I became an instructor with Chin Track Days and became a chief instructor with them. And then a little over three years ago, uh, had an opportunity to take a full-time position with them as an event manager. And when the lockdown happened, the, the entire Chin team, there's uh, you know four of us, five event managers. That's our whole job now became what are we going to do so that we can hold events and get back to the track, get back to work? Uh, that was kind of our entire focus for that whole period. So we put a plan together um, and, you know, we shared it with our track partners. Um, we had the opportunity to open several of these tracks, be the first events that those tracks had um, post lockdown there. And since the lockdown, we've done 23 uh, events uh, under our COVID guidelines. Uh, myself, personally, I've been involved with 13 of those events, either uh, leading them or uh, as support staff for that event. Uh, actually, this weekend, we have three events going on uh, that will all be operated kind of under the same COVID guidelines at three different tracks. Okay, great. Michael, would you give uh, everyone a quick background? And uh, I think everybody knows where you're <laughs> What, what, where you are and what you do. But, uh... yeah, thanks, Ross. Yeah, the president of Watkins Glen International, I've been up here for 11 years. And, you know, kind of what Jim said, you know, we went through 
you know, such a kind of a slap in the face when it first started. And we all, I'm sure we all thought it was going to end relatively quickly, but, um, you, you know, there was a lot of planning going on and, you know, with us owning 12 racetracks, we had a lot of experience, a lot of cross talent experiences, but, uh, it's been a learning experience. It's been a lot of fun. Um, to some degree, it's been uh, very disappointing, um, on some others. We, we canceled 10 events this year, but, um, you, you, you know, it's, it was about all that planning, like Jim said, and testing and going through processes of trying to learn how to do this. And then living in New York State, uh, living with the governor's executive orders and, and a lot of criteria that was put on top of that. So it's it's been an educational year. There's no question who would, who would ever thought that we would uh, be experiencing a hundred year pandemic like we are, but uh, we have. We've I think we've all weathered it very well to this point. We've got, uh, like you said earlier, uh, we don't know what's going to happen. None of us have that crystal ball, but we sure hope that uh, as we progress in the next year, we can live and learn and, and go from there. But uh, more to come on racetracks and uh, and, and more on uh, how we process that. Thank okay. you. Steve, Libby? Steve, you want to? Uh, sure. Hi, I'm, I'm Steve Libby. I'm the driving events coordinator for uh, the Puget Sound uh, BMW Car Club. I'm responsible for putting on all the track days, organizing uh, the logistics for all of our track days, which also include a car control clinic uh, at two different race tracks, one at Pacific Raceways and one at uh, one at the Ridge and Shelton, Iowa, uh, Shelton. And of course, the uh, Seattle area being the, one of the epicenters of the whole COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic has certainly presented a, a few problems. We initially had six days uh, booked and prepaid at Pacific Raceways, and the first two were canceled. Uh, but but uh, we figured out a way to uh, to actually have instruction uh, within a lead follow uh, mechanism that I kind of dreamed up, and it uses uh, some radios and communicators. And so far, we've been uh, we've been profoundly uh, successful. Um, I'm a UW microbiology faculty member, so I kind of take this uh, infectious disease stuff pretty seriously. We I, I can say that uh, we have had no problems of people adhering to the guidelines that have been put out by the state, King County, and those that have been imposed on us by BMW CCA. And um, and and uh, and our own, and our own staff here too. So we are doing it. What I think seems to be pretty well. Okay, and I, and I will say that uh, Steve has advised me through the past few months uh, as I've been getting onto airplanes. He's like, you know, this is the kind of mask, and this is what you should do, and everything. Yeah. So <laughs> you're still alive, Ross. I think it's good. <laughs> Just barely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Scott. Hey, Ross. Uh, so I, I, like I said before, I'm here from kind of the extreme example. It's what I what I have to bring to the table isn't really relative to HBDE. It's just kind of a what um, what the experience of uh, putting on a professional motorsports event um, at that you know the world championship level uh, as what I can bring to that in terms of what Formula E did in Berlin and. The fact that I went through a process and I basically had seven COVID tests in a matter of 26 days and the, the extreme things that we had to do to actually be able to put on um, an event uh, of, of that caliber uh, in, in the time period that we did to be able to finish the season. So it's um, it's I think it's a good contrast between some of the things that are able to happen during an HPDE event and then some of the extremes that, that we had to go through um, being, you know, traveling internationally and doing some of the other areas that that were required of us by by uh, by things that, that most people actually aren't aren't able to do at the moment. So, you know, as as an example, I can't go to Michael's racetrack without quarantining for fourteen days. So, you know, things like that that are, that are a little bit different. Yeah. Well, and and uh, I guess Scott, putting our MSF hats on for a moment, uh, you know, one of the things is, you know, again, on behalf of the MSF, thanks for everyone being on this webinar. Uh, both as a, the panelists, but also as guests in uh, listening in on to, to learn. You know, one of the things that uh, uh, Scott and I and Eric Myers are on the board of the MSF, and we've had many conversations around what can we, you know, the MSF is not in a position to be able to say, you must do this. Uh, that's kind of beyond our, 
uh, mandate, I guess, but just trying to bring people together to share best practices is, is what we're trying to do with the MSF. So with that, hey, Jim, can you can I put it back to you again? And now you could kind of just go through what, what was it, 23 events? Yeah, 20, 23 events um, over the past couple of months. Um, I think it's, it's also pretty important to discuss uh, kind of the why of all this, um, in addition to, to the how. Um, if, if organizations, event leaders, uh, staff members, and drivers understand the why that we need to do some of these things, um, the resistance to accepting some of these new practices uh, will tend to drop. Um, you know, first and foremost, it's the safety of the drivers and, and the staff and the participants uh, at the event. Um, my wife uh, actually got COVID-19 and we've been married for 32 years and this is as sick as I've ever seen her. Um, it, took a, it took a trip to the emergency room and uh, we were both, I mean, really, really scared. And I certainly don't wanna see somebody else have to go through that, uh, certainly um, having been caused by, you know, either my own negligence or, or my reluctance to, to do my part. Um, to date, we're not aware of a, of a single case uh, being traced back to one of our events. So that's a, that's a positive thing. The, the second why um, is that we all do our part to kind of maintain the viability of, of the hobby. Um, you know, their, their state, county, local authorities are uh, doing whatever they think needs to be done to protect their, their constituents. Um, you know, and, and regardless if we agree with them or not, doesn't doesn't really matter. Um, one thing we don't want to see happen is um, someone comes in, they see our events, uh, they view this and go, oh, no, this has to stop. Uh, this activity is far too conducive to virus transmission. Um, you know, while this is a hobby, there's also a lot of people uh, whose livelihood depends on it. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I, uh, I earn my living in motorsports and, you know, you've got uh, the track managers and the staff that works there um, and all kinds of other small businesses that kind of rotate around the motorsports industry. Um, I've had conversations with um, folks at the track, with, with employees, and, you know, they, they've got this legitimate um, deep concern that uh, that their track will be shut down and, and they won't be able to uh, to hold events anymore um, and they won't have a job. Um, so some of the things that we've done here, you know, the first thing that we did was really analyze all the touch points in our procedures at the track. Um, the the biggest one is that driver liability waiver. You know, the that's eight pages long and everybody's fumbling through it looking for their name and grabbing the pen and signing it there. And we recognized right away that that um, absolutely uh, had to go. So we pursued using electronic waiver. Um, the first couple of events that we did, we used DocuSign. That was a, a product that we are using for some tech forms and some other things that we do. And that was a little bit of a, a challenge to kind of um, get it reconciled with who signed it and who didn't sign it and, and contacting drivers. Um, now there's actually some companies out there that, that provide products that are real specific uh, to our history. Uh, we're using Smart Waiver. There's a Speed Waiver uh, from the folks at Motorsports Reg. And, and these applications now allow it to kind of be integrated into your registration form. So it's considerably... Um, I mean, it's, it's seamless how it works together. Um, and not only does this electronic process kind of eliminate that touch point of, of the waivers at the track, it reduces the face time at registration because now when a driver comes up, uh, literally in seconds, we can have them checked in and get them their wristbands and have them moved on um, because they're not fumbling around with this platform. This is, uh, this is one of those things that we're going to, we're gonna keep uh, for a long time. Uh, we keep a, a QR code 
uh, right on the register table. And this will, the driver just takes his phone or, or passenger, they need to sign this waiver. They just scan this QR code with their phone, they walk away, they can go sign it, review it, uh, and then come back when it's all completed here on their own device. Uh, for tech inspection, what we do, we have drivers just put their tech form underneath their windshield, keep their windows up, roll through the tech line, and then we our staff can pull the form, uh, review it, make sure everything on their car is, is taken care of appropriately. Um, and, you know, we kind of we communicate all that pre-event, uh, which can be a challenge to get drivers to read everything, uh, but the information is all put out there uh, early. Uh, we evaluate the cancellation policy, too, for drivers that think, you know, they've been exposed or they're concerned about getting sick. Uh, we certainly don't want a driver to uh, feel compelled to come to an event uh, for fear of losing registration fees if they're sick. You know, we don't, don't want them to, uh, to come out. Um, our driver's meetings uh, were another area where people are kind of grouped together. And the, the first thing that we've done is we moved them all outdoors. There were some venues where we could have them indoors. We moved them all outdoors and we streamed them live uh, via YouTube. Uh, we chose the YouTube platform uh, primarily because it was universal. Uh, people didn't need a special software to use it. It didn't take a login. Anyone with a link can, can view the live feed. So it's a lot simpler uh, for our drivers to get to. Um, we also um, we just bought something. This is simple. A, a little PA system here from Amazon, uh, from Hisonic is the one we got. It's under two hundred dollars, and that allows us to, when we're doing the drivers meeting, to uh, you know people can hear us and not be packed together. And that's for the drivers that uh, choose to attend. But one of the drawbacks, the things I don't like about doing the, the online drivers meeting. Um, one is getting it set up because you, you're setting this up trying to broadcast a meeting and it's those crucial minutes right before the driver's meeting and that's of course when uh, a lot of drivers are it's, um, it's busy they're all wanting to get registered before the driver's meeting so it kind of adds another step there and we're um heavily um kept in check by the bandwidth at the tracks First is, if you're gonna use track Wi-Fi, do they have enough bandwidth for us to even upload or deliver the meeting or drivers to download, or we're gonna use, uh, use cellular, data, cellular data. And of course, you know, a lot of these tracks are not, uh, they don't have great cell signals. So we're kind of um, have that challenge with doing it. For our, we, we have stuck with in-car coaching um, because we, it, we evaluated the lead to follow and we couldn't see how we could be effective at that with our uh, with our program. Um, so we put some guidelines in place for that. First is that the driver and the instructor are wearing face coverings under their helmets in the cars. Uh, the windows are down in the cars. When using a communicator, the student keeps, you know, they get their, uh, their earpiece. They keep that for the duration of the event. At the end of the event, they can hand it back and it can be sanitized. We provide the sanitizing wipes and the mask for novices, instructors, if they need them. Uh, the debrief get, needs to be done outside the car post session. So once the session is over, exit the vehicle, do the debrief. Um, one of the things we've implemented that I, that I do like, I, I'd wanted to do this for a long time and there was always some obstacles. Now we were kind of compelled to, to do something. And that is introducing the novices uh, with their instructors prior to the event. So we'll send out an email three, four days before the event. And uh, the novices and instructors can then connect either by phone or text message, email. They can do that, that you know, five minute interview. They can find out about the car, find out what their goals are, what their experience is, and, and set a meeting place at the track and do this all before the event. So this not only reduces the face-to-face the -face time, um, but it also removes that section of the driver's meeting where we're introducing novices and instructors. We don't have that uh, anymore. 
Our classroom instruction kind of varies from track to track based on the facilities. Um, if you've got a venue that has a large enough classroom to support the social distancing, we'll use it. Pit, Pit Race is one. They've got an enormous room uh, right down there uh, along Pit Lane there where we can easily put our novices in there. Uh, Sebring, we moved from the media center and we moved that to the Gallery of Legends uh, room. And we're, we're exempting novices that have already attended this classroom before. If they've been to prior events as a novice with us, then they're exempt. They don't have to go to the classroom. And that kind of also reduces the, the load on the classroom. Watkins Glen was very specific. There was no indoor meetings of any kind. Um, and that includes the garages. The garages there are considered inside space. So we, uh, we really couldn't do a classroom there. So I, I did the presentation, uh, recorded it uh, while I gave it in, into a video, uh, uploaded that to YouTube, and then we distributed that link to the novice drivers uh, prior to the event so that they could, they could either watch that uh, before the event or perfect time during the event there. Uh, you know, it, it's not it's not ideal. You, you don't get that that uh, in person interaction that you can when you have a live classroom. But you know, we got to work with uh, with what's available as well. I'll say the the most controversial or or the most loathed is the the face coverings. Um, nobody likes to wear them, but it is pretty much a necessity at this point. Indoors all the time, outdoors. Anytime social distancing can't be maintained. Um, it, this is a real challenging one. Different tracks have different expectations on what's required. Um, it, this takes this takes strong leadership at the event to, to make it happen. The staff needs to lead by example. Um, you know, if someone's approaching our registration table and they don't have a mask, they, you know, we throw up the hand and say, well, stop, go back, get your mask. Um, you know, and tracks may shut down the event to get uh, to get some compliance. Uh, Mike will verify this. We've we had it happen where the track has uh, penalized us ten minutes um, for non-compliance, and usually the non-compliance is is mask related. Um, and that tool is not just one that the track has. The event management staff also has that tool available to them as well to um, help motivate drivers to, to do what we have to do there. Uh, and we're certainly always willing to work together with the, our track partners uh, on the compliance issues. Thanks, Jim. Uh, much appreciated, great stuff. Uh, first off, I hope your wife is doing well. She is fine now, yes. Most it, important. Um, yes. And, and actually you, you kind of brought up a really good point in there uh, early on was, I think what we're learning through this process is gonna make us better in the future. You know, there are some practices that, that are being developed now that are just gonna make the whole experience better, even when we don't need to go back to these things. But uh, yeah, yeah so this, is good. this is making our, our sport better. Michael, uh, I, I gotta imagine that, uh, <laughs> Running a track and having to cancel a bunch of events earlier this year was was not easy, but uh, you've learned some stuff along the way as well. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, and, and um, Jim covered a lot of it, which is awesome from his point of view. And uh, but you know, from a health and safety point of view, uh, wow, did we learn a lot? You, you know, it was very interesting. And you know, I, and Jim started off with the why, and I guess I'll start off with the why of from a racetrack point of view. Um, hopefully, that um, you can glean some information from me. I'll try to represent um, more than just Watkins Glen, um, but representing the ownership uh, with NASCAR owning 12 tracks. But Watkins Glen International, um, outside of Daytona, um, Charlotte, you know, California, uh, Miami, we're one of the busiest tracks. We rent from the beginning of April to the end of October. So we're a very busy, busy club track. And then we have 10 events, 10 race weekends, eight race weekends plus two non-race weekends with our wine festival and beer festival for those that don't know. But, um, you know, it, it, it was really a why. So the why of safety, and we started early, you could say um, I, I literally hit the panic button early. 
uh, with my staff. Um, I was in Phoenix and not getting a good feeling from the NASCAR, at the NASCAR race. Um, I called the track and I just said, I got a bad feeling that this thing is going to start going. And we were all starting to learn that mid-March before the cancellation came. And, and me, I got on the phone with my VP on a Sunday from Phoenix and we started ordering for clubs because we knew that the clubs was going to be important. The big races, we knew we had PhDs that were already being hired on our staff, consulting staff. But the, the big key on uh, speaking with my VP, we started um, buying disinfecting machines before the panic hit. Uh, we actually got two of them uh, within weeks when they were in months. And those machines were fogging machines, just like if you've seen them on Delta or anywhere else. We started buying those for bathrooms. We, you know, we didn't know classrooms were going to get shut down at the time, but we figured we better have them so we could disinfect. Uh, we started putting together a plan like immediately. And um, like I said, maybe a little panic button there, maybe a little bit of overreaction. Um, we didn't know it was going to come true because it did. And uh, then we started events canceling and going from there. But, you know, it was all right down to pens. Like I'm calling a friend of mine that does souvenir and swag and whatever you want to call it. And, you know, I'm calling him going, I need 7,000 pens. He's like, 7,000 pens? I'm like, logo them. I need them quick. You know, because we wanted everybody for registration. Like Jim was saying, uh, he went to DocuSign. Well, we can't do that in New York or our company doesn't allow us and our insurance probably doesn't allow this. But, you know, for every club out there, you know, we like to think that we have a reason why we do something or we do believe we have a reason to do something. And DocuSign would be great. But, again, we can't do that as a company. Our insurance company will allow. But, again, pens within weeks, you know, making sure that we had staff to make sure to clean all these things. Jim said, outdoor classrooms. Then we had to start educating. Well, th this this is all April, and then every you know the breaks just hit. New York State started going down in a big shutdown. We were number one in every category, every negative category, according uh, uh, simulated with uh, COVID. So you know, the, you know, the governor did the right thing, stepped in, started doing his started doing his executive orders. Obviously, we started losing the events, but you know, kind of fast forward. You know, we were buying masks, we were buying gloves. Um, I know people in the fashion industry in New York City. Um, I had them reaching out to places like Dominican Republic to buy uh, masks and gloves because you couldn't get them at the time. But I had somebody that knew somebody that knew somebody. And, you know, before we knew it, we had 10,000 masks sitting in Watkins Glen. Then we were getting with our attorneys, you know, and trying to work with what do we need to do for clubs. Uh, we knew events were a different scenario. But just concentrating on all our clubs. And, and as I said, we were the busiest racing every single day from April to the end of October is 154 days of club rental. There's only like four days that we're not racing live at Watkins Glen, um, including the weekends. But uh, so it's a busy, it's a busy place, but we thought that we could get through the beginning. And before we knew it, you know, we're buying all this stuff. Uh, we're getting the stock load and, and we're protecting ourselves. And then the governor quietly and, and publicly was obviously shutting down activities in, in all in good nature, all in good uh, protection of citizens, as we know now, um, didn't know that. You know, as he said from day one, nobody has a crystal ball. So, from a racetrack point of view, we were ready. And and then fast forward all the way up to July. You know, May we're canceling events. June, you know, thirty days in advance, basically every club was canceling because travel, COVID, obviously, uh, couldn't get the hotels, couldn't get on airlines, couldn't get to New York State. Then the travel advisory hit in June. Um, from the governor, and that really slowed down clubs because we have clubs from all over the country. Uh, Jim mentioned it, you know, he coming from Florida and some other places, you know, how we had to cover and work um, under the executive order of the governor. So a lot of these things took a lot of time to put in place, but it, again, at the same time, we had had the time. So then fast forward to July now, now we start racing again, um, and then we had to learn. We, I was calling, personally, I was calling every club, walking them through we had a contractual amendment put up uh, to, to deal with COVID. A lot of the clubs, and it, it was in writing, but a lot of the clubs felt that it was their gym put together a great thing. But we contributed. We put ambassadors out there to, tell, to remind people. And we got multiple compliments of, of our ambassadors. They weren't walking around heavy-handed, heavy-fisted. Uh, it was like, oh, please put your mask on. You're, you're under the garage, as Jim put. You know, New York State qualified that garage as an indoor facility. Uh, so whether you were a mechanic working or how you worked it. So, you know, we we did our best to enforce the executive order. That was our goal. That was our communication point. 
And, and it was also, you know, yes, it's self-serving. We don't want to be shut down. But we also know how our clubs feel about Watkins Glen International and racing, period, whether it's at Sebring, us, California, Charlotte, Road Atlanta, uh, Sebring, as I mentioned. But um, all these places are important to all the drivers. And all these places are important to track representatives like myself because this is an industry. It's a huge industry. Our local in our local businesses, just so you all know, to pat on, on your back, not ours, our local community economics rely more on car clubs than they do our big races. Uh, because you're turning that, we turn it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We can turn 125 to 300 drivers a week. You start putting that math together, and it makes a big difference. So I, I applaud all the clubs. I applaud all the drivers, the mechanics, everybody that's associated in this industry and what they do and how they do it. Now, we had to limit people, too. Uh, we eliminate, I think we, we put three people per club, which some clubs it didn't go over very well. But we had to create a, a mini bubble of acceptance. We had our policies at our gate. You know, you had your temperature taken. You had your question of fever. Were you around anybody with COVID? Uh, have you seen or been in and around anybody in certain hotspots? And uh, those questionnaires, every single day when you came into Watkins International, you were you were addressed in that fashion. So, you know, it wasn't, again, trying to be heavy handed. It was a fact of let's get this um, motivated. Let's keep this cooperative. Let's let's make sure that, as Jim said it over and over again, and I'll say it, the health and safety of the clubs. Nobody want we didn't want anybody and knock on wood. We haven't had any reported cases coming from Watkins Glen or drivers or clubs. So. I'll say between the clubs and Watkins Glen International and all the other racetracks that you all attend, I think that's probably the biggest thing that we were able to to accomplish so far. Knock on wood, I probably just jinxed it, um, but you know it meant the loss of our license if it was if we violated any of that. We took it very seriously. So um, again, like Jim said, clubs did as well. We appreciate it. Um, we're going to keep doing this, and uh, we look forward to next year and getting over this hump. So I uh, appreciate that, Rose. Michael, I'm sure we're going to end up with some more questions because as soon as we got on prior to the start of this thing, I immediately had questions for you. So there, I'm pretty sure we're going to get some specific questions for you as we get into the Q&A thing. But one of my takeaways from what you talked about was how quickly you guys jumped onto the planning part. And, you know, while everyone could kind of go, well, we're past that part of it. But I think the biggest thing and, you know, even Jimmy, you talked about it as well, is just you guys really sat down and thought about what needed to happen and really started to put a plan together. And I would think, you know, I'm looking at the names of people that are on this webinar and I recognize a lot of them as experienced event organizers, instructors. And I know that a lot of them are doing a lot of these things, but I think just that whole message of plan ahead for this thing is really important. Yep. Steve. Okay. So, um, I'm going to kind of give you all some uh, some nuts and bolts about exactly how we made our H how we brought back our HPDE program and our car control kind of uh, back at, at uh, in, in the Puget Sound region. So we have two tracks we go to. One is Pacific Raceways in Covington, Washington. It's a really nice little track, Ross. You've been out there a few times, and it also has a it also has a gigantic paddock where we run a, a car control clinic. Basically, you know, go out there and people. Uh, Chase Cones. Oh, I have to say one thing. A uh, uh, shout out to my good friend Chuck Lutz. Who, Chuck is in Texas now, and he and I went through the instructor clinic together here a long time ago. Hi, Chuck. So what we prided ourselves in, and, I, and I'm sure I'm all, all clubs do, is the E part of HPDE. We don't run lapping programs. All of our track days are all always have an education program to them. We have four run groups, A, B, C, D. D is novice, A is solo. Um, and then we always generally, <clears throat> in the past, D people always had somebody in the right seat. And the C group, which is sort of the moving up group, normally had someone until we felt confident they were signed up to go solo. Obviously, um, COVID changed all that. And we, we had to figure out what, what, to, what to do next. Likewise, the car control clinic also had people and the cars chasing and, and, and cones. So we had to figure that out. Well, I listened to, so I'm gonna admit it. I listened to all the MSF uh, webinars and talked about, um, you know, uh, the lead follow and, and how to do these things with hand signals. 
and I just didn't like it. So um, I wanted direct communication between an instructor and the driver, the coach. I wanted those people to at least to be a really profound one-way conversation on how to do that. So what we so COVID rules for for King County, uh, Washington was. The first two events, a April and May, were shut down completely. And then uh, King County uh, allowed allowed the Pacific Raceways to have an event of greater than more than 50 people because uh, infection rates were down and they can guarantee you know, uh, social distancing. So we did. So for the first time ever, I think in the history of probably uh, Puget Sound region, we had a laughing day. People were just so pent up. They wanted to get on some seat time and go to a drive. So we let... We had three run groups, let everybody get their brains going. But during that time, um, at one of the sessions, I tested something out. And so uh, being the scientist, you know, I have, I have a protocol of how we did lead follow. And, and Ross, um, after this is all over, if anybody wants that written protocol or the names of the radio equipment and uh, earpieces and stuff, just direct them to me, I'd be happy to provide that. Okay. So um, what we came up with, um, actually, what I came up with was this radio. It's a uh, it's made by Samcom. I can give you the model number. It's got 20 channels on there. It's a U, uh, UHF radio. And the nice feature is it's got this little green button right here in the middle, and that's called group call. So as the person who was sort of in charge of all the novice groups and everything, I could talk to everybody. Uh, who had a radio in in their ear, and so our first ones were these really cool the CAA style, you know that would snake down to your shirt and everything and up in your ear. Uh, people thought it was kind of cool and it worked out pretty slick. The problem was was that the instructor had to take their hand off the wheel to press this, which is up here by their by their um, by their collar. Well, uh, Mark McGee from Golden Gate Chapter was down uh, observing all this. And he sent me a link where this is the push to talk button. And that push talk to button can go on your steering wheel. And now every, you can just have your hand on the wheel and you can just push and talk at the same time. So we uh, we, we are now into this and it's, it's in, in its entirety. I have a written protocol. Uh, I got 20 channels. I can listen to everybody. So these radios are about 80 bucks a piece. And we've been keeping Amazon pretty quite busy. So we've, uh, we did this. Well, I meant I was going to comment that uh, we don't have classrooms at Pacific Radio or Pacific Raceways. We have outside. And so we've been holding classroom sessions or driving meetings in the pouring rain for as long as I've been out there for almost 15 years. So we're, we just put some couple layers of Gore-Tex on and off we go. So the, the, uh, the sessions start out by uh, the, the, uh, the instructor and the D driver, novice driver, are in pairs. And the first sessions go out where we uh, drive, the instructor drives and talks around the track. And uh, we generally have four sessions to five sessions per event. And then depending upon how that, that pair works out, what we like to do is we like to switch it off and have the driver uh, lead the instructor around the track. Now that actually works out pretty well. And if you all know uh, in the BMW world uh, and certainly being out here with all this money in the tech business, there are a lot of M3s and M4s out there. And so when I'm standing up there at start finish, I'm kind of looking down and I'm seeing, man, this, this doesn't look like D group to me. But it's what's interesting is the uh, I can listen to everybody talk around the track and I can hear um, the short direct commands and, and turn in, track out, that sort of thing, rather than this war and peace dialogue that's going on. And it's working absolutely perfectly. Um, the, the, having the, the, uh, the student lead the instructor actually works really, really well. And as Ross said, I think early on, in one of the early webinars, the ability to have a an instructor be comfortable with this type of lead follow and a radio communication is not going to be universal. 
there's going to be some some people who are just going to be like really weirded out by this and some of them who are, are going to be really comfortable we've had both but for the most part everybody's been very comfortable and they're working uh, work really hard to um to facilitate this um just i wanted to say one thing yes we we have used speed waiver all of our tech forms are emailed in to our registrar and and also pacific raceways and also the ridge have their second waiver there that everything gets signed so there there is no paper flat out uh there in the morning i stand out there and i check everybody in and the uh, uh, the night before actually two days before that email goes out there or whatever it is, you will not be allowed on the track, period. And that seems to get people's attention. Uh, we've had 100% compliance. Um, the fact that we don't have a classroom um, uh, outside means we've been able to social distance with, with, no, with no problems at all. We just stand out there in, in the rain. Actually, it's, it's rain. We've, we've had one event where it hasn't rained so far this year. Uh, I, think, I think the most challenging part right now to do lead follow is our, our fast high horsepower cars. The instructor driver pair has got to be good. If you give somebody, I used to track an old E30 318 IS and there would be no way I could keep up with an M3. And that's, I think is important because you don't want to have your, your student driver feel as though they're being held up by your inability to keep up. And you know, people are drivers are pretty good, and um, uh, they expect them to be going at a, a certain decent pace. In my opinion, the other thing that we've done is held the limit of, of driver pair, driver coach pairs to about ten. So that's twenty cars on track. That's a lot for about two and well, Ross. I think uh, I think Pacific Race like two and three quarters miles, something like that. You get 20 cars out there, and you tend to have a tendency to get some trains. So, so let buys tend to be have to be coordinated. It's a damp, and we have some protocols for that. We've we've got that one figured out. So the other question is, how do you sort of keep an eye on C and B drivers? And for that, we embed senior instructors in the run groups, and they and they drive within within the group. If we see someone struggling, especially in our intermediate group that probably needs a little assistance, we'll just hook up somebody and they'll do a lead follower or follow lead and then we'll do a download session afterwards. Uh, it's, it's really pretty, it's pretty easy. Some of the things going forward that I would, I would, would like to do, maybe we can talk, uh, talk about it is I got a, there's a, there's a box, uh, a box feature on these phones. I just have to figure it out. But I'm a little worried that the, the, the ambient noise that's in the cars are going to interfere with that. Other people have been using the Senna Bluetooth wireless uh, systems very effectively. And I don't know if there's anybody from Audi, from uh, Audi uh, in the, right, on right now, but they've gone to the Senna system, uh, which works extremely well. And so what we don't, um, with the center system, you can have a little more back and forth discussion between, you know, your uh, student and the driver. With my radio system here, it really is meant to be one way. And uh, the downloads and discussions of how things uh, occur afterwards. So um, there's, if, if I had to start over again from scratch, I would probably do the uh, Bluetooth type of, of connection. So uh, what's going to happen in uh, 2021? Uh, we don't know. BMW has mandated, BMW CCA has mandated this to the end of the year. Uh, we, we abide by that, of course. Uh, if whatever happens, uh, vaccine or not, we'll probably incorporate some aspect, uh, uh, some aspects uh, of this lead follow thing uh, for the future. The other uh, thing that we're doing now is we have two instructor candidates, and normally those candidates would would be doing a lot of role playing and uh, left and right seat uh, uh, communication. Uh, that's uh, that doesn't happen now, so they're getting to use the uh, the the lead follow with an instructor, and we do role playing uh, 
uh, on the track um, in real time. It's probably going to take just a little bit longer, but uh, but that's that's okay. I just I I um, have to uh, echo uh, what Jim said. I think we have all most of the three minute interviews are done in uh, by via email. We have everybody contact. We've been doing this for years. Everybody contacts their uh, student way in advance so that uh, during the day of the morning of the track, there's much less uh, time spent, but um, that seems to work. Um, I think um, I think also not having someone else in a car, uh, it may be less intimidating for some people. I think, you know, having just this little voice in your ear saying, good job, track in, look up, that sort of thing. Some people may actually um, feel more comfortable with that. And I think that probably in the future, we're going to to uh, incorporate that. And most importantly, I'll just, I'll just close here, that um, you really have to ask your instructors if they are comfortable in this lead follow manner. Uh, if they're not, and they hesitate a nanosecond, then you have to find, you really have to find somebody else. Um, the other sort of down part of this whole COVID thing is we can't have any spectators. We used to have a lot of family and friends come out. I know uh, Extreme Experience is coming up this, uh, this starting this Thursday for four days at Pacific. Normally they'd have this family and friends. Other people have been, I've instructed for them a few times, People have gotten engaged out there. There's kids all over the place. That's all been shut down. So there's, there's just drivers only. So that's that's a, a bad part of this. But um, we've been successful. We haven't had any complaints. I think I think the Pizza Sound area is pretty tech driven. Uh, they like the tech, and the, and uh, I think I think you have to be a little heavy handed probably and say these are the rules that we're going to follow. You all, if you don't, A, we're going to get shut down, B, you might get sick. So that's how it's worked. Thanks, Steve. I, I think maybe you could actually turn that around and say, you're going to get sick and we're going to get shut down. Yeah. <laughs> I think, well, what, what's worse, right? Right. Um, yeah. to, to, to me, one of the, the takeaways from what you were talking about was the importance of putting, again, that plan, that protocol in place. And I know you spent a lot of time, we've talked about this, and you put a lot of thought and planning into building that protocol. And I suspect that you've tweaked it along the way, but uh, uh, I, and I've seen a lot of people kind of chiming in the chat box here with different solutions on the radio side of it. And I, to me, the best part is guys are, you guys are figuring this out and uh, there isn't one definite solution yet that's gonna answer all this, but uh, I'm glad that people are looking around and trying stuff and um, all good stuff. Scott, what was Berlin like? How about turn your mic on there? Yeah, I know, I got you, I understand, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I didn't wanna, didn't wanna mistakenly interrupt anyone else. Um, it's funny, I, I thought I knew exactly what I was gonna talk about. Um, because you and I had some conversations about it and everything, but but listening to what everyone's saying, I think what's really interesting from my perspective is that um, the the things that we had to go through to put on, you know, a professional quote unquote level event uh, with Formula E and and just I mean just as a little as a little note, I mean anybody that follows the International Sporting Code, which other than the United States, every other country in the world follows that general rule book from the FIA. And so the FIA actually created a new Appendix S, which covers COVID protocols for events. Um, and everybody in the world has, has those. And so it's interesting that all of those things that have been done at a professional level are listening to everybody and all the other panelists uh, and realizing that everybody's picking up on doing the same things. Um, and it's not just professional motorsport that has uh, a certain level or a certain type of procedure that they're following everybody around the world is following these procedures in the same way. So, you know, as an example, um, everybody's talking about e-waivers and, and how they're going paperless and things like that. Normally, um, and I went to grab one, but I don't have one handy. Normally I have a hard card. That is my pass and my credential. Um, we started using this, which was a, a digital credential 
that I carried on my phone that utilizes the uh, near frequency reader in my phone. So that's how I got in and out of the track every day. I signed that, I, I scanned that uh, as, as I walked in, I got a temperature check as well. Um, the other thing too, you know, Michael was saying they're asking questions every day that everybody goes in. I had to do the exact same thing twice a day. Um, I did it via WhatsApp, but I, the WhatsApp would send it to me. It would ask me if I wanted it in German or, or English because it was done by the Berlin state. And so I followed it. It was the exact same thing you guys are doing. Have you been around someone with symptoms? Have you had symptoms? Um, you know, all of those. So I had to answer that twice a day, every day. Um, the extreme part of what we had to go through at, at the Formula E race was that we were all in bubbles. Um, and so I work in race control and there, there were three other people in my own, my race control bubble. We were the only people that could associate with each other. We all rode in the same rental car. We had to have dinner with each other every single night. Um, we couldn't leave the hotel. Um, so our hotel actually scheduled us for, um, they had four different restaurants at the hotel. So either you had Italian or German one, you know, and they told us where we could go. Um, and so it was just unique. I mean, it was, you know, all of the driver meetings, everything that you guys are doing digitally, we did the same thing. All of my driver's briefings and my team manager briefings were all via Zoom calls. Um, everything was digital. Um, you know, we, we supplemented everything with WhatsApp. We supplemented everything with, with emails. Um, I had the ability to go talk to drivers one-on-one, -on -one, but we had at the event, we had different levels of PPE um, guidance. And so normally it would just be a face covering. Um, but if I were to leave my area, which was either my office or race control, I had to step up to a PP, P, PPE2 level, which meant I had to wear an N95 mask. Um, even whether I had glasses on or wearing my contacts, I had to wear safety glasses overhand. And I also had to wear gloves. So, um, you know, and obviously that was all required even with social distancing. So it was a little, I mean, it was a little bit of a different approach, but I think it's really, really interesting to see that um, what we had to do for, you know, a quote unquote professional event and what the guys in Formula One are doing the exact same thing because they're we're all following the same protocols. Um, I think it's interesting that it's the exact same thing you have to do for an HPDE event. It's not, it's not any different. You're all, everyone's following the same, the same kind of rules. And, um, you know, I guess that's what makes it a best practice. Um, is that everybody seems to be doing it and everyone's following it in the same way. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't have anything specific to HPDE and I appreciate the fact of even being able to share my unique experience of going through that process uh, with Formula E. But, um, you know, I think it, I think it's really interesting how, again, how it all, we're all doing the same thing, whether it's, whether it's a track day or whether it's a, a world championship event, we're all doing the exact same thing. And that is trying to be safe, trying to get through it. Um, and as Jim said, you know, it's, it's, um, what it really boils down to is it's not if you, it's not about whether you believe in it or not. It's whether you want to protect your hobby or your sport or your industry and take care and still, and still have it and still exist. And, you know, I know for sure Michael wants his track to be open and I know for sure you other guys want to be able to do events. And so that's what it's about. It's not, you know, from MSF, we're not telling people what to do. We're just saying what other people are doing and how it's working. And the fact that we want it to still keep working and we still want everybody to be able to have these events. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about my experience. Scott, you know, what's interesting to me is I've been to uh, countless number of events over the past few months. Uh, I started traveling again the last week of May. And I think, I think I've been on the road at a track every single week other than maybe one or two since the last week of May. And, you know, so I've seen a lot of what different organizations, different tracks are doing. Um, and, and, and I got to tell you, one of the things that kind of, no, doesn't, I was going to say kind of upsets me. No, actually does upset me is, is this. I see people at the track and they're doing a good job because they're told they've got to do a good job. And I see them out in the evening and they're in, at restaurants sitting next to each other, you know, sharing a beer. Like, it's like, come on guys, like, uh, it's a bad example. So, and, and I think to your point, Scott, is I think, you know, the whole, we're all in this together. Um, we need to show that our sport is better than everybody else. So uh, the fact that all of you are online here to actually care about this thing, I think is fantastic. But I think if we can get everybody to really buy into that, that 
let's let's be the example. Let's set the example. Let's set a higher bar than anybody else and prove that we can do this. I think it's fantastic. You said there's no cases come out of Watkins Glen. Jimmy, you said nobody's come out of that. I know, you know, nobody's come out of, out of, out of the event around here. So uh, I think the more we can do that, the better. So. Well, we're, we're, we're very unique in motorsport from the standpoint that, and I say this with zero scientific back backup to, to give it to anybody, but I, of all the events and obviously as we all do, we all pay attention. And Michael, I know you're paying attention to the NASCAR races and I'm paying attention to all the other races that's going on. Um, you know, we haven't had to cancel an event because of a COVID outbreak because of these best practices that are being used. Um, you know, we all see baseball games getting canceled all the time and, and things happening. Um, now granted, it's a different sport and things are very different, but I don't know that two guys standing next to each other on first base is different than two guys sitting in a car with each other. Um, you know, honestly, in terms of social distance and things like that. So I think I think the industry has something to be really, really proud of. And a lot of it comes from truth of the matter is and what what I'll reference as because it's that my experience is as at different levels. But I think what's happening is the bulk of motorsports that is, is occurring are these track days. Our yeah. folks like Chin, folks like BMW Car Club, folks like HOD that are making it happen and making it work. And so, um, you know, the pats on the back. I'm right along with you, Michael, the pats on the back go to our, our industry and our community for making this happen and making it, making us be able to get back because I, you know, events like that, I mean, Watkins Glen, notwithstanding the, the regulations for the state are a little bit different, but I'm confident that the fact that um, HPDE events were able to run at mid Ohio is what allowed IndyCar to come and run at mid Ohio last weekend. And, and what is allowing these, these, these national championships like IMSA and IndyCar to be able to go to these other events. So it's because they've tested it with HPDE and have been able to prove their procedures that they're able to do professional motorsport. So I think that's a big deal for what, for what our community has been able to prove. That's cool. Hey guys, uh, have some questions. Uh, and I'm not sure who I'm going to point this one to. Uh, Bradley asks, where can we find good COVID guidelines to follow for motorsport events? Do any of you know of them? And Scott's going, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I can tell you right now, you can go to the Chen website and look at what they've posted. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've, they've, they've got stuff out there. Uh, the performance racing industry has a guide. Um, there's a there's a there's a nonprofit group called the United Motorsports Association where they've also posted some COVID guidelines. Um, I think if you just do some some Google searching, you can find some stuff. And I'll try. I'll, we'll see if we can get a good idea, um, and and see if we can maybe post some links on the MSF website as well. Uh, Dave asked the question: Anyone using electronic tech forms? No. Uh we we have used them uh, in our annual tech program uh, through DocuSign, so we we have done it, but it it's not really scalable. I don't think to do you know for every event, full event, it have to be something different. Which you know perhaps one of these the, the companies, uh, Smart Wave or Speed Waver, may be something that they look into being able to provide. We just have we, we just have the people just uh, either uh, you know scan it or take a picture of their phone and send it into a registrar. I thought we'd never have to use it, but sure enough, we had an incident in August, and I had a complete a uh, accident form with a photo of a tech form. Okay. It worked. It was accepted. Uh. Phil asked the question, uh, interested to hear what the lead follow practitioners have to say about overcoming the limitations of not being in the car. And if you guys don't mind, I'm going to I'm going to take first crack at this because I started using lead follow back in 1987. So I've used lead follow for a long time. And there were no radios back then. We didn't even have electricity back then. Uh, so. Uh, uh, I, I, I think if you, and you know, I, I talked about this when we did the lead follow webinar uh, back a few months ago. And by the way, that webinar is on MSF's uh, website uh, as well as the YouTube channel. So you can go there. You can probably hear me say the exact same thing. Lead follow works a lot better than most people think. It's different and it takes a little bit of time, but mm -hmm. overcoming the limitations, 
as Steve, you pointed out, there are some students who actually learn better mm -hmm. in a lead follow situation because it allows the driver to have to think rather than simply turn now, brake now, on the gas now. And they're just basically following along with what the in-car instructor is telling them. So I think rather than focusing on the limitations, focus on the fact that it actually works in a lot of good ways. And I think, um, you know, we could, again, we could spend another hour just on that topic. Oh, wait, we did that a couple months ago on that webinar. So, well, so the, the comment I had back from one of um, our instructor candidates was what I, what I um, am missing is the feel of the car. And as you all know, as who are instructors, you know, that feeling of that car doing something that you know something bad is about to happen is something that you don't get when you're, when you're, you know, 30, 40 feet behind. But I, you know, as, as Ross said that if I think if you, if an instructor is doing a good job of transmitting uh, instruction ahead of the driver, not at, not at the driver, uh, then you're going to um, be successful. And second of all, really the instructor is setting the pace. We're just not going out there and letting the, letting the driver just go, you know, flat out. They have, they have to know that the instructor's got to be in the rear view mirror in that situation. And so that's the pace that it's set, not, you know, blasting down the track. And I guess related or flipped around, and I'll point this one to you, Jim. Uh, Dave asked, how can in-car instruction happen under social distancing guidelines? Well, we really haven't seen uh, an issue with it. Uh, everybody is informed upfront exactly what the expectations are and how it's all gonna play out. Um, we haven't gotten any resistance from any of our track partners that we go to. And I haven't seen resistance from instructors either. Um, we, you know, we're seeing maybe some reduced instructor sign up, but it, it's not that they're not signing up as an instructor they're not coming to events at all because you know they're either at high risk uh, or have other concerns about it so uh, haven't had any concerns or issues along those lines okay um well and, you know you know ross that you know ross that bmw pca and audi said there will be no in-car instruction correct yep yeah, yeah. And, and i think part of that is pretty tough to be six feet apart from somebody in a car. Right. And if you've got government guidelines saying that, um, that that's a challenge. So right. uh, your organization is going to have to make some decisions around that. Um, and I guess uh, real quick on this one, Jim, just Daniel asked for in car, do you simply use balaclava or something more in terms of masks and things? A baklava will be uh, acceptable uh, or, or a mask or other type of face covering. Uh, do you mandate that it actually has to be over the mouth and nose rather than just the chin covering? Yes, yeah, it does. And, you know, the thing is, um, the corner workers are watching. The pit out steward is watching. Um, yeah. I've heard Watkins Glen corner workers call in say there's two people in a car and I can see a nose or I can see a face in there and uh, they, will, they will call them in and we will black flag them. Okay. Um, Bruce had asked the question, good info for event chicken, but how can, but can we talk about how this will affect novice instruction? And Jim, Steve, maybe you guys can just kind of quickly kind of give the, uh, does it have, has it had a negative impact on somebody that's relatively new coming in? Um, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I don't think so. I, I think they're, they they'll get the same experience. Um, I think it's probably a little better than what it was before, as far as their being able to get some pre-event contact with their instructor, um, pre-event communication. Um, it helps them to ease into the event a little bit, uh, maybe reduce some anxiety there. Uh, the check-in process in that, you know, we're still greeting the novices, we're still greeting the drivers, 
still giving them direction and say, hey, did you connect with your instructor? Uh, this is where the classroom is. Um, we still give them all those same things. Um, you know, I, I would say the one limitation has probably been the elimination of an interactive classroom uh, like what we have to do at Watkins Glen, where they're not getting that kind of interaction with the classroom instructor. Um, but other than that, I don't think they're missing anything. No, I don't, I don't think so either. I think I think people are having a lot of fun. In fact, we're having unprecedented numbers of novice people signing up for these events now. Um, we're going to a track in, in Shelton, which is sort of stretch out the ridge a little bit. We figure we can put maybe 14 pairs out there. That's 28 cars. Um, we're going to give it a shot. We've been advertising our program as a way to get people involved in this sport. And for us not to do it, to figure out a way to do it, would be reneging on the promise and the advertisement. Um, I hope it doesn't rain. <laughs> Well, Steve, I hope that we get some rain here so we can uh, wash away some of the snow. Well, yes, <laughs> that's true. Hey, Jim, I, I'm going to have to disagree with you on one fact, and uh, the, the drivers are missing one thing. We weren't, we, we weren't able to do any catering this year, so there was no lunch at the track. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, had, we, we had a catered lunch. So we, we, did, we still had catered lunches, and people just kind of hung out together. If they had that brought the pop ups, you know, they're all doing the six foot, you know, six foot distancing or got in the cars and, and stay. I saw two guys recently bring, they had a fold up table, looked like about six feet, you know, three and three fold in. And sure enough, they were on either ends of it, you know, and hanging out and doing the thing. It's like, great guys, couldn't see it. Well, so, as you yeah, know, nothing's really changed. No, well, I'm the president of the food service company for NASCAR too. So at least in, in Watkins Glen, Jim knows this. Or well, you probably know it all the. Not only did we do the buffet during the day, but we also did a happy hour over in the club. So we didn't get to have any of that fun this year, but we're going to put that back in line for next year. Yeah. Miss the miss the happy hour for sure. There you go. What one of the other one of the things I think that has come through both from Jim and from Steve is the amount of uh, prep helping novices beforehand. And I'm going to kind of do my little promo thing here myself and Ryan Staub. Uh, wrote a ebook called uh, the HPD First Timers Guide, and if you go to the website of HPDE dash or hyphen first being the number one st dash timer dot com, somebody can actually type that into the chat thing for me. Uh, there's a link to that ebook. Send it out to every single one of your novices. Because all and all it's doing is it's just trying to give people a uh, sort of a, a glimpse into uh, uh, get, get, help them prepare for what they what they're going to expect or what they're going to see when they get to the track. So um, I'd highly recommend that you send that out there. Obviously, I'm biased because Ryan and I spent a bunch of time putting that thing together. But we basically sat down and went, "What are novices when they first show up? What would they have liked to have known?" And we stuck it in this ebook. So again, it's HPD so we, we, dash first one st dash timer dash or dot com. So we, we're still doing the we're still doing the twenty five dollar discount for people going in and logging into your speed secret, you know the HPDE part, and then Ross was uh, Ross and uh, Don Kitch were were uh, generous enough to make a very slow drive around Pacific Raceway, and Ross did the narration with a uh, little funky graphics on it, which has been profoundly uh, successful and people love it. So maybe you got to get a little creative to come up with some new tools to help novices feel prepared when they show up. Hey, hey Steve, um, can you tell us the names of the radios? Uh, Dale had asked, can you provide the specs for this equipment so we can leverage oh, it over? Sure. And I know a yeah, bunch of people other things, but uh, um, just, uh, if you could share do you those. Type it, do you want me to type it in here? On the yeah, there you go. Type it in there. Uh, someone, someone put on on there. It's a Samcom. If you just go to uh, Amazon, it's a FPCN30A. That's the name of the radio. Um, somebody said that these things cost us uh, eighty bucks a piece. But what I like about them is. We're going to use these things for other events 
that we have. We had a shutdown. We, you know, I don't know if you all know this, but the E30 Picnic has 300 E30s. We have these burgers and BMW that brings in 600 cars, and we use these for parking to communicate. But, so you, we, I decided to convince the board, rather, that it's a decent radio. It's got, it's got an aluminum chassis in it. Uh, they've been dry. I see them being dropped and being swung around by the antenna, and they're still hanging in there. The battery is, it seems to be all day sort of battery. So, yes, they are more expensive. Uh, it's a UHF frequency. And then these earpieces, I'll get you guys the, the Amazon. The, unfortunately, the three piece, um, push to talk, uh, button, I buy that from eBay and I will provide you all with the, um, the catalog numbers for that. And it was important someone ask on here. These are one way trips. When we hand these things out to people, I don't want them back. I they can keep their cooties with it on there. So, uh, so yeah, they're, there it's it's a little expendable but you know i don't want to have to deal with uh i don't want to have to deal with with uh sterilization and they're you know their batches are about 18 19 dollars a piece and not every single one of them works perfectly so i have extras of those we haven't had any problems so far hey uh karen said that uh the download uh option on that website that i just gave for the ebook isn't working. You know why? Because you have an ad blocker on your browser and it's blocking the little uh, sign up box. So if you go into your browser uh, setting, turn off your turn off your ad blocker for uh, refresh the page and the little box will pop up so you can download it there. So then you can turn your ad blocker back on after that. Hey, Michael, maybe this is uh, aimed a little bit at more at you and maybe to Scott as well. And I can kind of give my experience. Um, is anyone measuring temperatures of participants as they enter the event? Yeah, we're doing it in all our facilities, and, and we're all, we're doing it in our office every day. Every time you leave, every time you leave the office, so everybody walks in, everybody that drives in walks into international. Uh, you get the questions, Scott and uh, Jim talked about it earlier. Scott mentioned it, um, so you get your your basic questions on COVID, and then you get a temperature test. We log your name, date, time. Um, it's just something that uh, we feel mm -hmm. uh, we haven't. Um, if anybody's over 100, um, they get pulled aside. They get checked again and again. Uh, sometimes that's go behind the ear. I've been over 100 because I was in my convertible and the sun was beating on my forehead. I uh, didn't have a didn't have a fever, but just they pulled me aside like they're supposed to, and they did another uh, subsequent testing. But, um, but it's part of the process. It's something I I, I don't see that going away anytime soon. Um, at least in the next six months, but uh, hopefully it'll it'll we'll be ready for 2021. So we've got a few more questions, but I uh, kind of want to wrap this up because we told everybody it'd be about an hour, already an hour and 15 in. So uh, we're going to kind of do the uh, uh, the quick uh, responses here. Naomi asked, uh, I've seen feedback about participants not feeling comfortable with other participants wearing the face masks with valves in them. Suggestions? I think it's a great point. Anybody? Don't wear masks with the bells. <laughs> and, and, and I don't know if that's, uh, you know, maybe that's something that organizations need to think about is, can anybody show up with any mask? You know, do you have any kind of specs for what is a proper mask and what isn't? For us, New York State was as long as it covered your nose and your mouth. So it could be cloth, it could be a bandana. Um, you know, everybody has their opinion. Um, Steve and I have a a better guidance on this, but uh, as long as the nose and mouth were covered, it was acceptable to us. We did we did not regulate the type of it wasn't an N95. And it was, I think I, I think the guidance is now is anything you can do to prevent aerosol transmission is going to be vastly important. I mean, I, I haven't seen that many of the valve ones. I I know what you're talking about. But most ones I see are just a straight up medical mask, you know, surgical mask or, or a face covering or some, some funky pattern or something like that. I think anything you can do to, to reduce aerosol spread is probably okay. And maybe the point here is people that show up at these events, they're customers and the okay. customer experience is important. And if they're not comfortable, they're not going to come back and they're maybe even going to say bad things. So do what you can to control that. Right. Um, 
uh, and Michael, this is for you. Eric asked, uh, what best practices learned from COVID might we see at Watkins Glen International and other NASCAR properties in 2021 and future? Oh, we lost your audio there. I think we're all going to play by, you know, the, the evolution of this pandemic. I mean, there's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. You know, if, if we're, if we get a vaccine and we can start releasing and, uh, some of those um, COVID protections, particularly here in New York State, we know they're the toughest. I'm still very supportive of the governor, what he's done. We have the lowest, some of the lowest numbers in the country. But I think what you're going to see is testing, temperature testing, and, and the question, I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. And I think social distancing, I, you, maybe masks will go away, but I don't think social distancing, you know, we got to maybe there'll be a, a, a blended a blended uh, answer for all of that. I, I don't see in the immediate future, I don't see much of a change. We expect at least probably to April or May of next year to see the constraints uh, um, is what we see in the racing business. Um, and I'm talking about social distancing, mask, and so on. Um, we don't anticipate, I'm not going to I hope we all hope we're wrong. The vaccine will be here soon and we'll be able to start relaxing, but we just, we're not going to put our money in, the, in that bank. Okay. Um, perhaps, that, perhaps an upside to all this is maybe cold and flu season will be reduced because no one's, you know, breathing and wheezing on each other. And people are washing their hands and not maybe. touching their face. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Roger had asked, uh, I'd like to hear more about classroom practices and uh, classroom education alternatives. Um, uh, Roger, I'm just going to kind of say we're, we're kind of running out of time and we could spend, I could easily spend two hours on that. Uh, send me an email, info at speedsecrets.com, and I'll try to help out there. Uh, let's see, where was the other one here that I really wanted to, us to dive into? Um, and, oh, uh, Jim, maybe uh, Freddie had asked, if we have a full face covering race helmet with a visor only when we're driving, do we still have to wear a face mask? What, how do you manage that if somebody's wearing a visor or a full face uh, helmet? Right now, we still want to see a mask underneath there. Again, if that's if, if we have two people in a car, you know, driver, passenger, novice instructor, um, that's what we want to see. If, if you're driving your car by yourself, you don't need face covering. Um, hopefully that's obvious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, Michael, here, here, here's one for you. Bradley wants to know, how do you sanitize portable restrooms at the track? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, we're kind of missing you. Hey, Michael, could you uh, start that again? I don't know. You we lost your audio there. I keep, I turn it off and turn it on. Okay. Um, sanitizing is only surface cleaning and is not a 100% effective. Disinfecting fogging is um, what the machines that we bought um, actually attach to all the surface and, and clean those surfaces. Clean, disinfect, which is 100% effective. Sanitizing is 50 to 70% uh, uh, dis, uh, uh, of that process. So disinfecting with the fogging machines has been proven out to be very effective. So uh, we're only going by what the machines and the chemicals that we bought to put in those machines. Okay, um, Ivan had asked, apart from the driving line, what else can uh, can we can we as instructors focus on? Perhaps a different vantage point from being outside the car also affords new points to pay attention to. And I'd highly recommend, and I don't know, Jim, Steve, if you guys are doing a little bit more of that where some of the instructors are uh, doing more observation from corners and things. I don't know. Uh, that's that's an experience that uh, I've used and it works very well. So I'll, I'll say that when we have enough instructors to spare, uh, we're putting some or candidates. We'll put we're putting spotters in corners, and I give them a clipboard with some card numbers, and then they provide us some feedback to see how some of the some of the new solo drivers are are doing. And then CB will will have a talk and down. We use the download sessions after everyone comes in off the track. We meet as groups, and then everybody talks and, and talks about the the session. So we've always used the download. Audi Club has really pioneered that out here. 
the, the group download is very effective. Yeah. Hey, uh, Phil asked, for more advanced drivers, how about the use of instrumentation to analyze drive behavior such as timing and smoothness of inputs? Yes. And actually, last question. And I'm gonna, uh, it's kind of a, more of a comment than a question. And uh, Scott, I think uh, I'm gonna aim it at you. Alan said, I see most of the webinar is focusing a lot on the times. Uh, I'm assuming the times we're in right now. Uh, I'd really like to see HPD event organizers standardize things, i.e. group colors. Also, if you're an HPDE instructor, you've attended standardized training, like a governing organization. Like, I don't know, like Motorsport Safety Foundation and the certified program <laughs> for instructors. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. There you go. Check the box. Yeah, We're there. Um, <laughs> hey, everyone. Uh, thank you, first of all, for being on and listening and uh, participating and asking questions. And, and one of the things I love about these webinars is uh, people are sharing information that they've learned as well. So I love that part of it. Thank you for sharing your experiences. Uh, Jim, Michael, Steve, Scott, thanks for contributing tonight. Uh, I think we've made our sport safer and healthier. Thanks, to Ross, for organizing this. I think this is very helpful. Uh, thanks to Motorsport Safety Foundation for organizing these things. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate your, yeah. your time. Okay. And with that, uh, stay safe and stay healthy out there, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.